Thank you all for joining us to the to our webinar series, Solutions to the Opioid Crisis. My name is Houston Spohr. I am the Director of Community Relations for Project Opioid. And this topic hits near and dear to my heart for many reasons, but the most is it helps me stay healthy and in recovery. I suffered through 10 back surgeries, four knee surgeries, 22 broken bones, and which led to a 15 year long opioid addiction and many, many other issues dealing with mental health. But the biggest issues were sometimes being able to get myself back up moving. And I was able to utilize Eastern medicine along with Western medicine. And that's what you're gonna hear about more today. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Project Opioid. Project Opioid is a coalition of faith and philanthropic and business leaders coming together to help solve the opioid crisis. COVID-19 poured gas on the issues of overdose and mental health issues, and the number of people that have died has gone to over 40% across the state. So before we get started, I would like to thank the people that made this webinar possible, Central Florida Cares um, Health Systems, Lutheran Services of Florida Health Systems, and Southeast Florida Behavioral Health Network. We also have upcoming webinars. Please go to our website to look at these. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to two of our, two of our speakers, Dr. Anis Khalif of Acupuncture Fit, here located here in Orlando, and his surprise guest, Dr. Emi Husada from Seattle, Washington. Dr. Anis, please take it away. Hey, Houston. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Good evening, wherever you're watching from in the world. Um, my name is Dr. Anis Khalif, and I'm just super thrilled and honored to be on here with you today. I'm on the executive board for Project Opioid. I also own an integrative practice in Central Florida called Acupuncture Fit, where I did my internship with an orthopedic surgeon from China who developed an acupuncture technique for symptoms of overdose and opioid um, addiction. And we are using his technique and another very specific technique that I'm going to go into in practice as an adjunct to help really move the needle in, in this crisis in the right direction. So I'm just super honored to be on here today. I want, I want to thank Andre and the team for putting this together. And, and ultimately, I want to thank you, the, the viewers who are watching today, to, to really look to, to solving, you know, a, a solution to solving this, this uh, overdose crisis that we're going through. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and dive into my portion of the presentation there right now is a there is an acronym that I want everybody to get familiar with and that is ALTO. ALTO stands for alternative alternatives to opioids. Next slide please. Great. So a little bit about my background, a little bit deeper. Um, I'm very, very big on community. And I firmly believe that as we conduct individualized studies in my practice and we serve our community with altos, which is alternatives to opioids, um, um, the, the, the reach that, that gets in our community is just huge. Um, here I am pictured with one of our, our hometown uh, favorites, Chris Mueller from the Orlando City uh, soccer team. Um, I'm very fortunate to be able to treat many um, high-powered athletes and also many other people um, who, who have orthopedic injuries specifically, um, you know, as, as an alternative to using opioids for, for um, some of their pain symptoms. So in my practice, we marry modern technology with 5,000 years of ancient medicine by delivering our scalp acupuncture treatments, um, certain functional testing, which Dr. Emmy is actually going to be going into today. I'm super excited for her to come on and also traditional Chinese medicine membership programs to really help our community in Orlando achieve optimal health. So our biggest mission is to educate our community because we are in a current crisis that, um, that you, know, you know, there are many, many of, of, of our loved ones that we, we know personally and others that we know in our community that are suffering from, from this crisis. Next slide, please. Awesome, so I'll go ahead and cue this video. You're watching Wrench 2. 
The state of addiction taking over the U.S. has made its way to Capitol Hill. And the focus today, stopping fentanyl from getting smuggled into the U.S. Now, fentanyl is widely considered the next phase of the prescription drug epidemic. It's one of the most potent drugs, 100 times more powerful than heroin. And the DEA, which is leading this effort to stop the smuggling, says fentanyl made in Mexico and China is fueling this epidemic. The cartels have discovered that manu manufacturing fentanyl is much more cost effective, efficient, and draws less law enforcement attention than cultivating opium poppies to produce heroin. Fentanyl sees that our U.S. Southwest border is typically 5 to 10 percent in purity. Deaths from fentanyl have tripled in the last three years as it is cut into and mixed with heroin. Last year, 10,000 people total died from fentanyl. And fentanyl is prescribed to patients with severe pain and usually as a last resort. Prescription medications, negative effects are why so many people are looking for alternative ways to heal their bodies. Well, she's Michelle Imperato talks with a doctor and patient using the ancient art of acupuncture in place of pills. I injured my tailbone really bad uh, early in high school, um, and then ever since then, um, some upper back pain as well that goes into that, and then I tore all the ligaments in my ankle as well. 27-year-old Emily Wayne had been living with soccer injuries for nearly a decade. Doctors put her on strong painkillers while she was still in high school. She didn't like what they were doing to her body, so she stopped taking them. As an adult, she still wanted to play soccer for fun. So she decided to try acupuncture for pain relief. Acupuncture has been around for 4,000 years, and I don't really know too many things that are not legitimate that last 4,000 years. Doctors with the American College of Physicians agree. New guidelines for lower back pain now include exercise, yoga, and acupuncture. Dr. Anise Calif started treating Wayne a year and a half ago. I'm a living story to tell that if you try something that um, has worked for thousands of years um, and just kind of test your faith out, um, I think you'd probably be pleasantly surprised. I warm it up a little bit with the fire so it's not cold on her. Dr. Anise also treats patients with cuffing, and this therapy got a lot of attention during the 2016 Olympics when we saw gold medal swimmer Michael Phelps using the treatment. The procedure helps bring new blood and new nutrients to the body, and it removes what's called internal stagnation. Michelle Imperato, WESH 2 News. For more information about resources here in Central Florida, head to WESH.com and click on the State of Addiction tab. State of Addiction is WESH 2's year-long commitment to report on the issue of addiction and help in our community for those who are struggling. Great, thank you. Next slide, please. So in, in the, uh, the, the video that you saw, they, uh, Michelle, she talked about new guidelines on um, non-opioid um, anesthesia to interventional pain management. This is a, a bill from the Florida Department of Health. It's, it's uh, one that passed that uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that it passed because it's really um, spotlighted a lot of non-opioid alternatives for pain. And next slide, please. So you'll see um, from the Florida Department of Health on this uh, other side, there are <clears throat> suggestions for patients, all twos, alternatives to opioids to try, which include physical therapy, massage therapy, acupuncture, which is my specialty, chiropractic care, um, you know, even OMT, behavioral interventions, topical treatments and medications, cold and heat therapy, exercise, weight loss, diet, and nutrition, yoga, and Tai Chi, uh, TENS units, and even over-the-counter medications. So, um, how acupuncture really believes that the body heals itself is from the inside out. It's an inside out job. So we do look internally and externally. We are definitely not an end all cure all. However, I believe that we are a, a very good alternative to, you know, um, a chronic pain when it comes to, um, or alternative to meds when it comes to chronic pain. I've seen man, many, many success stories in my practice, such as Emily's story. Now, if you want to go into the next slide, I'd love to go into a, a story about the solution. Um, if, if you're interested in the actual studies before I go into this story, there are literally over 750 high quality um, acupuncture studies that are published and have been evaluated for safety, cost savings, cost savings and effectiveness um, and when, when using acupuncture versus opioids that are available on PubMed. And we'll definitely uh, get you that link so you can go over those studies. Um, so what happened was, uh, and, and, and for, for a while, uh, it really wasn't known that acupuncture could help with addiction treatment um, until around the 1970s, 
a neurosurgeon from China was doing an acupuncture point uh, as a pre-op analgesia. He did this because he noticed when he had um, opioid addicts in his practice, they didn't have opioid withdrawal after getting off the meds. He noticed that he could detox the patients from heroin and opium from just even using an acupuncture ear point. So there was a prominent psychiatrist in, in Bronx out of, out of New York named Dr. Michael Smith, um, who was actually running a methadone clinic in, in South Bronx at the time. And uh, the, this, the, the effects of what the doctor was, was using on his patients made the headlines and he read about it in the newspaper. And so what happened was uh, he collectively gathered a group of acupuncture physicians and started treating patients um, with this addiction protocol. And from there, uh, sort of a groundswell movement was developed. And since then, um, the NADA protocol um, is something that has been uh, actually taught in schools for integrative medicine when it comes to acupuncture. And that stands for National um, Association of De uh, National Acupuncture Detoxification Association. And the protocol um, works on the sympathetic uh, ear point. It's five points in the ear. It's an auricular therapy. Um, two of which are, are, are targeted towards mental trauma points, and the other three uh, looks at organs of detoxification that run along the pathways, or what we call the meridians, uh, and I, I, that's a whole nother lecture I can go over later, um, of the kidney, the liver, and uh, even the lung. So um, since then, uh, th this, this um, center has been in South Bronx, and many acupuncture physicians now have been trained on this worldwide. It's something that we use in my practice, and a lot of times when I did some medical mission work down in Haiti and in Mexico, I even used it, uh, you know, internationally to serve uh, the under underprivileged who are suffering from, from many of these addictions. So um, next slide, please. Uh, I'm super excited, uh, you know, really to, to just share, share this information with you. You know, tens of thousands of licensed healthcare professionals are available in Florida to provide, provide this care. And uh, there are, again, so many uh, patients that are in need of this. So with, you, with your help and, and the help of Project Opioid, I'm super um, excited to be here to, you know, answer questions and, and, and introduce our next guest. Um, next slide, please. And, and here are uh, three pictures that I wanted to show you that I'm super proud of. Um, top right, uh, our community leader, Dr. Joel Hunter, he is on, on our um, Project Opioid uh, board and just honored to serve with him. Um, below him is Senator Mel Martinez, who, who is a, a huge proponent of Project Opioid. And to the left is um, one of my dear colleagues, Dr. Josh Axe. If, if you want to look at a website that has legitimate studies, not just with and or regarding to overdose, but across all symptoms of alternative medicine. He's a great resource to go to. It's draxx.com. He's been on the Dr. Oz show over uh, three times and is his website is one of the most visited websites in the world. He has millions of followers across social media. Um, and uh, I actually use his technique to, to spread my message of alternatives to opioids and alternatives to, to other drugs um, or to use in conjunction with conventional practices on TikTok, where now we have over three or almost 300,000 followers for our account. Now, Dr. Axe just came out with a book called Ancient Remedies, where he does a deep dive into some of the techniques that are um, actually on that House bill flyer from the Florida Department of Health. So um, again, that's draxx.com, and you can find us at, at AcupuncturFit across all social media platforms and online. Next slide, please. So I want to end with this quote before I pass it to Dr. Emmy, which is, all neuroses develop from avoiding difficulty. If you take the shortcut, it's almost always going to lead to some form of neuroses. So this has kind of been my mission and my, my quote, um, and, and I heard this from Dr. Aaron Wall at one of our events, who is also a huge proponent of Altos and, and really just encourages you know, this as another add-on to what Project Opioid is, is doing. So um, again, I wanna thank you so much for uh, listening to me and uh, just super excited for, uh, for, uh, for me to introduce our next speaker. Um, the, the Project Opioid team can definitely send you a, a way to get in contact with me in our office. We also work virtually as well. So um, Houston, I can either pass it back to you and then um, I'll let you turn it over to Dr. Emmy. Sounds good. And then I'd like to introduce 
Dr. Emmy. Dr. Emmy, it's a pleasure having you. Thank you. All the way out in Washington. <laughs> That's right. Hi, my name is Dr. Emmy Hosoda, and I practice in Washington State. I'm a colleague of Dr. Anise. Um, we both work in a group of health professionals that is dedicated to spreading the message of health and wellness uh, throughout this country. Um, I actually am a conventionally trained medical doctor. I trained at UT Southwestern Medical Center, which is one of the foremost research institutions in the world. But I was turned on to functional medicine for two reasons. One is that it's really the ancient form of practicing medicine, which is really looking at the patient as a whole in their environment and, and looking at you know, what the root cause of the issues are that you're looking at rather than trying to just cover them up uh, symptomatically. Uh, and second is uh, my own heritage. My family has been in medicine for thousands of years, tracing their roots back to um, ancient Babylon in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, and then in the Persian court uh, under Cyrus the Great, a group of Jewish physicians who actually moved as uh, slaves in the court of Nebuchadnezzar and were taken because of their skill um, as honored members of the court in the court of Cyrus the Great. And so it's something that my family has been in for thousands of years and has practiced this particular way. And so I really related to it. And, and um, I got turned on to doing functional medicine because I have a child on the autism spectrum and there were not a lot of conventional types of treatments, kind of like opioids that were really helping. And so um, this way of looking at things at a more scientific and more basic level became very attractive to me and I became trained in it. And it turns out that there's a lot of literature that has to do with looking at these things at a very fundamental cellular and genetic level um, in both pain and addiction that can be brought to um, more effective treatments and setting people up for success uh, when you're trying to beat an addiction. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So chronic pain defined, uh, this is from uh, Varde and colleagues, which do a lot of uh, literature reviews and guideline type studies and, and papers. Um, so chronic pain is difficult to define. Most definitions have evolved from a consideration of pain that persists beyond the normal time of healing, typically taken as three months. And it may reflect a transition from the acute pathology, which is you know whatever anatomy was going on, to a persistent and often autonomous. So the pain takes on a, a life of its own, pain caused by changes in the peripheral and central nervous system. So it becomes not just whatever is causing the pain, but something multifactorial that's affecting many, many organ systems. And so that's kind of what we're looking at is, is why does that happen in some people and what can we do to make it better? Next slide, please. Functional medicine uh, is based on the principle of treating the root cause. So in pain and addiction, this means looking at the following things, and this is by no means a comprehensive list, but a 20 minute list. Is that 20 minutes? So inflammation, for any given anatomy, if you have more inflammation, you're going to have more pain. So you could have a disc in your back. Sorry, let's go back. Um, so you can have a disc in your back, but if you have more inflammation around that disc, you're gonna have more pain than if you have less inflammation. Uh, life experiences and psychological factors affecting pain perception and addiction. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit when we talk about mind-body medicine, but in functional medicine, we go all the way back to your birth and we follow everything that happened to you to the point that we saw you and look for the point at which uh, you started to have problems with a certain thing. So we look at everything, dental history, uh, how you were born, were you breastfed or bottle fed, starting there and just going through your entire life. And it's a very systemized approach at looking at patients. Nutrigenomics, so what genetic factors are contributing to what you're experiencing? And that's actually one of my favorite things to talk about and something that I'm known for. Um, anatomy, so what's going on anatomically to cause issues, and then neural pathways for, for pain. And this is actually where I really love acupuncture because um, anything that has to do with nerve pain is really, really well treated with acupuncture. And that's kind of the first place that I refer when I'm looking at someone that has a nerve time pain, that burning uh, pain that seems to go from where it's supposed to be to other places. Um, and so it's, it's really a, an amazing tool for that. Next slide, please. So uh, inflammation, you know, we all know what it looks like. I mean, we've seen, um, you know, an inflamed toe or something with someone that has gout. Um, but basically, uh, it, there's several things that cause it. There's free radical damage. So um, that's one of the causes of inflammation. Wear and tear is another 
foods and inflammation is another that I'm gonna go, in, go into. And related to that is intestinal permeability and something called serum sickness. Um, and then also genetically inherited tendencies for inflammation exist. So some of us have genes that make us more likely to be inflamed than other people. Next slide, please. So free radicals, just a quick chemistry lesson. Uh, free radicals are made anytime you burn something. So if you're burning food in your stomach, if, you're, if you have a factory that's spewing uh, smoke, that ha has a lot of free radicals. Fires have free radicals. And free radicals have an electron that's kind of in an orbit by itself, and it's trying to get a pair. So it's kind of like a you know, teenage boy on prom night without a date bumping into everybody trying to find itself a mate. But in the meantime, it really causes a lot of damage. So rust is actually free radical damage from oxygen. And you can see that on the inside when you have free radical damage, it kind of looks like you know, rust on the joints or, or that sort of thing. Um, and it's very common because free radicals are rampant in our environment, much more so than what our ancestors faced. So you know, our ancestors were subsistence farmers or they were um, you know, um, hunter-gatherers and they didn't burn a whole lot of things. They might've burned a fire once in a while, but they weren't facing like factory smog and this sort of thing. So in our generations, we're facing a lot more free radicals than, than we're used to handling. And so it's really important that we address free radical damage um, as a source of inflammation, because it is one thing that is going on that's, that's making us more likely to have it. Next slide, please. So minimizing free radical damage, uh, one is avoiding free radical containing foods, uh, such as uh, BHT, which is a free radical um, preservative that's in a lot of foods and actually a lot of supplements. The leading multivitamin brand in the country contains BHT, which actually the, the you know, um, way BHT is noted on labels is BHT with a dot and the dot is free radical. So it, you know, kills microbes, but it can also cause a lot of inflammation in our bodies. Living in clean environments without industrial pollution. So, you know, you may not think that the things that we're seeing in our environment is related to pain, but it actually can be. And then antioxidants such as curcumin and pycnogenol can be helpful when, we're, when you're dealing with a free radical load that is much more than what our ancestors are facing. So that's one of the things that we use um, in functional medicine is trying to go back to what's the mechanism behind this inflammation and what are some of the things we can use that your body recognizes, such as curcumin and, and pine bark extract um, that your body's seen before at some point in history. Okay, so going on to the next slide. Um, so there's another source of inflammation, which is actually your food and how well your intestine keeps foods in. So basically your intestine has this barrier, it's called tight junctions, and it's where two cells come together. And in the healthy intestine, that barrier is intact, and there's also like sort of a mucousy layer on the inside made of something called short chain fatty acids. And that keeps the intestine together and it keeps big proteins from leaking across your intestinal wall. And the reason you don't want big proteins to leak across your intestinal wall is because your immune system works on attaching to big proteins like viruses. And so it recognizes this food that leaks across as something foreign and it starts reacting to it. So that's why you want a, an intact intestinal barrier. And there's several things in our society that, that go against having a good intact uh, intestinal barrier. So one of the things is foods such as gluten and grains and dairy um, can actually damage the intestinal wall especially because in the last 100 years, our intake of gluten on average has increased by something like 20 to 200 times, depending on the kind of culture that you're looking at. Um, other things that can damage the gut are things like medications. Like people think of ibuprofen as something really uh, benign, but it's actually damaging your intestinal wall. Uh, other things that can do it are things like antibiotics because they kill off the good microbes and then the intestinal wall becomes sort of denuded and you can have damage. Um, so basically one theory centers around these large proteins from foods leaking across the gut and triggering an intestinal response. And the poor intestinal barrier can allow this to happen. And then these antibodies that form, they're kind of like, you know, little, um, little particles in your blood. And what they can do is they can deposit in your joints and they can cause pain. So it's kind of a serum sickness phenomenon. Like if you got, you know, the wrong serum uh, or something like that injected into you but it can happen just from the foods that you're eating. And this is super common, something I see very, very often in my practice. There were some studies done at Bastyr University, which is the naturopathic university here in Seattle, looking at that. And the tendency for foods to actually increase the markers of inflammation in the blood 
Um, and it turns out that the foods that are really the most messed with in society, those that are the most industrially produced, tend to have this effect the most. Next slide. So this is kind of what we were talking about, the, the gut membrane and the fact that it can become leaky. You can actually measure this leak in stool studies. Uh, there's a protein called zonulin that gets released when you pull the cells apart. And you can find this in people's stool as kind of evidence that um, whatever is happening in their gut is basically making the permeability worse and causing these proteins to then leak across the gut and cause inflammation in the body. Next slide. So the evidence for a food-based source of inflammation is tenuous but mounting. Uh, it's increasingly seen in clinical practice. Most of the evidence comes from population-based studies, animal studies, or very small randomized clinical trials involving people. But I can tell you I've done this work for about 20 years and you see some miracles six weeks after people come off these inflammatory foods very often. Um, stress can serve as a source of pathological intestinal permeability also. The hormone cortisol is made. Um, in the old days when we were, you know, uh, hunter-gatherers and trying to run from, uh, you, you know, being prey, uh, cortisol was helpful because it shot up our blood sugar and um, also made our intestine more permeable so we could absorb more blood sugar. Uh, nowadays, a lot of people have chronic stress and their cortisol levels remain high, and this actually makes their intestinal barrier less tight and serves as a source of not only weight gain, but uh, which increases pain, but a source of increased permeability that increases inflammation because again, you have these big proteins leaking across. And there's a lot of basic science studies looking at this, um, looking at the leakage of things that shouldn't leak across the gut uh, in certain instances. So it is an emerging science with a lot of good basic science behind it. And when I was looking at treating my son who's on the autism spectrum, actually some of the same, uh, some of these same ideas came into play. Okay, next, next slide. So um, there have been some studies at the Cleveland Clinic Functional Medicine Clinic. Uh, they were able to achieve a 78% reduction in perceived symptoms of pain and disability using a lifestyle-based approach. This was mostly in patients who had chronic pain and inflammation, and many of whom actually had really serious things like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or other um, inflammatory diseases that normally are treated with big time medications. So what they used was an anti-inflammatory diet, mind-body wellness techniques, such as emotional freedom technique, which is a evidence-based acupressure base. It's based on the principles of acupuncture and acupressure, where you sort of treat yourself using these points that reduce um, cortisol, which we just talked about, and also uh, are shown to in both uh, PET CT and functional MRI to lay down relaxation pathways in the brain and really help relaxation. So that's those mind-body techniques are really a big part of what they did. And then regimens to reestablish the intestinal barrier and sort of stop that, what we call leaky gut in, in um, you know, layman's terms, but increased intestinal permeability in medical terms. So they uh, use substances such as glutamine, certain probiotics and fermented foods to make the intestines healthy again and to stop the leakage of proteins that were causing all of this inflammation and pain. Okay, next slide. So genetic factors in pain perception. This is actually one of my favorite things to look at because we're all so unique and we all have unique genes. And you know, a lot of people wanna blame people for their addictions, but the fact is that some of us are sort of a setup for that genetically. Um, so variations of genes that change the activity of certain enzymes can then influence addictive behaviors and pain. Um, these enzymes have to do with neurotransmitters or the little signaling uh, proteins in your brain that make nerves talk to one another. Those are some of the main ones. Uh, some of them also have to do with detoxification. Next slide. So here are some of the genes that can affect pain perception. The COMT gene, the COMT gene is one that gets rid of fight or flight hormones, including cortisol. Um, it also gets rid of certain hormones. Um, but people who have a variation of the COMT gene where they can't clear these fight or flight hormones are actually hyper alert and they have a bigger pain perception. So for any given pain where someone else might just see it as something minor, because they're so hyper alert and hyper vigilant, it becomes like a big thing to them, uh, you know, small amounts of pain. So the COMT variant is one. The MTHFR gene, which has to do with uh, B vitamins and how your cells handle B vitamins is important when it comes to pain perception, because 
It makes uh, the hormone dopamine, which has, or the neurotransmitter dopamine, which has to do with emotional memory, goes through this pathway, the MTHFR pathway. So when you have a defective gene, um, your ability to make dopamine can be compromised. And when you don't make dopamine, your dopamine receptors are still sort of hungry for dopamine. And so they sometimes will make you uh, seek things and do behaviors to try to increase those dopamine levels. And so it sets people up for a larger um, tendency to have uh, addictive behaviors. And again, all of these genetics are not in a vacuum. Of course, everyone is a uh, amalgam of their genetics and their environment, but in the right environment, someone who has the COMT mutation or someone who has the MTHFR mutation is going to have a higher chance of having addictive behaviors and someone who has normal you know, production of dopamine or a normal way of getting rid of fight or flight hormones. The dopamine receptor genes are similar to the MTHFR mutation and the problems that they cause. So again, if you don't have a good dopamine receptor, your brain isn't getting the signals of reward. Um, and dopamine is kind of a reward and punishment um, neurotransmitter, not just used for the other things it's used for emotional memory and attention, but one of the things it's used for is reward. And so if your dopamine receptors are defective, you're gonna be seeking rewards much more. And so that's gonna be something that actually predisposes to addiction. And it's been shown in studies that people who have addiction by and large um, have dopamine receptor gene mutations uh, in a large proportion of them, much larger than the normal population. And then there's the IL-6 gene variants, and those are genes that increase inflammation. So we just got finished talking about inflammation and pain. And so people who have this particular variant are also more prone to have inflammation, which causes more pain in the given anatomy. So you look at their MRI and go, well, it doesn't look that terrible, but they're experiencing much more inflammation for that given anatomy. So it's just something to bear in mind. Next. So the COMT gene, like we talked about, is responsible for detoxification. Uh, it makes people hyper alert. There's some things we can do to modify that gene. So a, a compound called SAMe or methionine has been shown to help people go around the cellular pathway and be able to degrade fight or flight hormones in a different way when they're given this particular supplement. And proper B vitamin supplementation and vitamin C can also help the function of this enzyme. And so it can set people up for more wellness if they have this particular mutation, if these things are given to them and uh, it helps their pathways. Um, stress management and mind-body wellness techniques, such as emotional freedom techniques, technique that we just talked about, can also be really helpful in people who have this particular mutation. Next. So the dopamine receptor genes, again, key in reward and punish, punishment perceptions. If you have a bad copy, you're going to have a less functional receptor. Uh, it turns out that exercise, both moderate aerobic and strength building exercise, improves the function of the dopamine receptor. A low glycemic index diet, which avoids blood sugar spikes, actually does that too. So it's shown that all addictions are sort of linked and sugar addiction is what uh, can be, you know, something that is a clue to somebody who has addictive behavior. Um, I don't know if many of you have done a lot of work with AA, but that sugar is one of the main things at AA meetings that people, it's the next crutch. Um, and so it turns out that actually keeping blood sugar stable is one of the keys to not triggering uh, bad things happening with the dopamine receptor. And then a mix of amino acids, glycine, phenylalanine, taurine, and tryptophan has actually been shown to curb addictive behaviors in patients who have this particular bad gene or gene polymorphism. Um, if they're given this mix of amino acids, their tendency to seek addictive um, ways of handling their dopamine receptor becomes lower. So there are good studies with these particular genes. And there are more genes like the opioid receptor genes um, that you could talk about, but these four are the ones that actually have really good studies as to what you can do to set people up with success. Um, next. So the MTHFR gene, uh, it works in the methylation of B vitamins, which is what you have to do to B vitamins to actually use them in your cell. Um, if you don't have a good copy of this gene, then you need to take B vitamins that actually don't need the enzyme that this gene codes for. Um, and it's key in making the neurotransmitter dopamine like we talked about, which is key in reward and punishment. So basically giving people the right type of B vitamins for their genetics can actually help this. And it's a very simple fix. Next. So the IL-6 gene, people with a slow variant of this enzyme do not degrade fight or flight hormones also. 
um, oh, sorry, this is actually, this was a copy of the other one. So the IL-6 gene actually has more to do with um, inflammation. So if, if you have the IL-6 variant, you're not going to be um, able to handle inflammation as well. So what we use in that particular instance is actually anti-inflammatory supplementation, things like curcumin, uh, pycnogenol, uh, cat's claw. So things that modify something called the COX-2 pathway, which this gene is linked to, and we can actually help control pain and inflammation as well as anti-inflammatory diet becomes much more important in these people. So there's people who can eat anything who have a great variant of this gene, but if you have a bad IL-6 gene, your diet is gonna be much more important. Next. So in conclusion, a functional medicine-based approach to pain is personalized and it help, may help mitigate physiological forces that serve as a barrier to recovery. So if the deck is stacked against you from a genetic standpoint, from a functional medicine standpoint, we can come in and kind of restack the deck, give you the things that your genes aren't you know, doing correctly for you and set you up for better recovery. So that's kind of the conclusion of that. Um, I think that is all I have to say, but I just wanted to bring up the fact that with functional medicine, we have a lot to offer that's very specific to uh, what people are experiencing. And it's very much based on the unique individual that that person is. Thanks so much. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Emmy. That's great. Um, brilliant. So uh, I believe I'm going to pass it next back to, to Houston. Uh, take That's it away, my friend. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank both of you very, very much for speaking today. Um, Dr. Emmy, wonderful. And Dr. Anis, thank you very much. And um, we're going to go ahead and take some questions, if that's all right with y'all. And give me a few moments. We've, we're correlating them as we talk. The first question. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Can they see that, babe? They can see that. Okay. Um, this is for Dr. Emmy. If I'm having inflammation in my joints, what can I do outside of medication to help with this problem? So what I normally do with patients that I see is I actually do a food sensitivity test to see what particular foods might be their issue and also a food allergy test. They test for two different kinds of antibodies, food sensitivity tests for IgG, which is a more long-term reaction. So people with this may not even know they have a sensitivity to their food because it's hours to days after they eat a certain thing that it's gonna cause them problems. And then I also do an IgE test, which is for more immediate food reactions but sometimes people eat a couple of foods at once and they don't know which one it really is. So I, I figure out what their particular in, inflammatory foods are. Um, and then I also do a gut test to see if they maybe have a leaky gut barrier or they had inflammation in their gut or an infection that's kept their gut from healing. And I treat that. And then I basically have them meet with a wellness coach who goes through the dietary changes they need to make both based on um, their particular food sensitivities and foods that cause inflammation in general. Um, so they go on like an elimination diet that's very strict for six weeks and then they add back one thing at a time to sort of see what is increasing their joint inflammation. And at the same time, if they have issues with their intestines, we do things to heal those issues. For instance, given the glutamine or fermented foods or probiotics or whatever their tests show that they need. And so with that two-pronged approach of healing their intestines and removing the foods that are causing inflammation, most of the time we're very, very successful in, in reducing pain. Um, people will notice, a lot of people don't notice how much chronic pain they walk around with until they actually do this. And then when they eat something that's off their diet, they're like, oh my gosh, it really was affecting me and I didn't know it. So it's, it's really a very interesting process. Um, so once we do that, uh, most people can add back most of the foods. I mean, our goal isn't to have people have deprivation for the rest of their life, it's to heal their gut so that they have a barrier that keeps things from leaking across their gut. Um, of course, we always want you to stick with more organic foods and things that aren't gonna damage your intestines again to try to limit antibiotic use. I use a lot of herbs in my practice for common things like sinus issues uh, rather than going to antibiotics. Of course, if somebody has pneumonia or something, I'm gonna use antibiotics. but but I try to minimize the you know, chronic use of antibiotics in my practice. I 
how to minimize the chronic use of NSAID type drugs like ibuprofen, which damage the gut. Um, I use alternatives for anxiety and depression uh, because the SSRIs are very damaging to the gut barrier. Um, so all of those things, <clears throat> sort of housekeeping things that you do to keep your intestines healthy will then reduce joint inflammation. And then if we need to, we use some anti-inflammatory herbs like curcumin, uh, we use fish oil, just things that in general drive the body towards a less inflammatory pathway. Thank you very much. And this is to, um, for both of y'all. Um, I noticed that when I take supplements, specifically B12 and <clears throat> antecedents, my joint pain increases. Shall I stop taking them? So whoever asked that question should really get tested for the MTHFR and COMT mutations. <laughs> Because uh, when you don't handle normal B vitamins, chances are that you're taking something that's actually clogging your detoxification pathways. If you take high doses of regular vitamins when you have these mutations, it's actually counterproductive. So for you, I would say you really need to see a functional medicine doc who knows a lot about genetic testing, someone like me or Dr. Anise or someone like us, and really have them thoroughly look at your genetics because that is probably the reason you're not handling these things well. Thank you very much. And this is for Dr. Anise. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, how long will it take to start feeling better? That's a generalized question. But well, after a general um, abnormality coming in, trying to get something uh, worked on with acupuncture, how long will it take till someone sees results? Yeah, that's a great question that I, that I get all, quite often. Um, and and to answer it directly, um, I want to do it before before I go into that. If you're listening to this right now and you're considering acupuncture, the number one reason why patients don't try acupuncture is because they think we use shots in here. We use injections. So I have a policy in my practice. We call it a no needle policy. We don't use needles, rather instruments. Okay. So if you were to look at an acupuncture instrument un under a microscope, it would be blunt, like the tip of my pinky. When it penetrates the skin, which it does, it moves the nerve endings left and, left and right. And a vast majority of the time, if done properly and correctly by a trained and licensed acupuncture physician like myself, um, you shouldn't really feel much of anything at all besides maybe like a little bit of a mosquito bite or something like that. You might feel some heaviness. You might feel like a, a dullness, a starburst effect we've even heard, like, like a, a tugging um, as, as we improve blood flow to the area that we are, what, what we're focusing on. And you can actually fit 12 to 15 acupuncture instruments inside a standard hypodermic needle. That's how thin they are. They're like the size of a, a cat's whisker too, as I see Houston just totally shaking his head like, yes, yes, I've had it before. And um, it, it literally <laughs> is like that. They're solid also, so they're not injecting anything. So um, yeah, so how long you know, will you see effects? It, it really is, is, it's a personalized approach to, to, to medicine. It's an individualized, what we're doing, and we, we perform these tests because we look at the body as an individual um, uh, study. And, and what's, what's happening as far as pain is that, that um, you know what, uh, there's, 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 there's chronic pain that, may, that you may be suffering from for years. And also there's more like sub, sub, uh, subchronic, subacute pain that um, you, may, you know, maybe just happened from a couple of months. It really just depends. I usually tell patients that if you're not seeing at least some sort of um, relief specifically in acupuncture, I mean, according to the NIH is, is, is fantastic for neck and low back pain. There's plenty of studies out there uh, when, in, and especially in those categories, if you're not seeing relief um, within the first, I'd say three to five treatments, maybe looking at another modality to add to it, or, you know, consulting your doctor on some other options. But I would say you should see some relief between three to five treatments, um, again, give or take. But again, sometimes in, with my patients, it's, it's taken, you know, many more treatments than that. I'd say about as far as like coming in weekly, it's usually in about, about a th three month process. Um, but, you know, something that our pr profession has done that has been a disservice to our profession, it's like, I'm going to go to the grocery store, then I'm going to go get acupuncture, then I'm going to go home, um, like, 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 just because I have pain. But a, a big motto in our practice is heal before you feel. This is why we call it preventative medicine. So I want to encourage you not to just seek out this care that Dr. Emmy is so eloquently discussing um, for when something has happened or an event has happened happen, but also coming in and looking, you know, how, um, you know, you can, you can maybe prevent or, or, or help your body heal from 
a lot of the uh, techniques that, that we do have. I hope that answers your question. A little bit more of a long-winded approach, but I don't have a crystal ball and I would just encourage you to try it if, if you are on, on the fence. Um, I treat kids as young as two to 102 years old. I have a question of my own. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> um, so can acupuncture help with my neuropathy where I no longer have feeling in an extremity? Uh, you know what? We have helped many patients uh, with the symptoms of neuropathy in conjunction with the conventional care, that allopathic care that they are receiving, and also without. We've, uh, you know, inducing blood flow to the area is just so key in, in helping. I mean, circulation is the name of the game. And, you okay. know, the definition of acupuncture is we're using, you know, these fine instruments um, that are stimulating our neurovascular bundles in the body to promote you know, blood flow. Uh, Dr. Emmy probably can, can explain the science a lot better than I can as, as, as a brilliant MD, but, and I know you, Dr. Emmy, you refer to your patients often for acupuncture, but uh, yes, um, I can safely say that, uh, you know, I've helped many patients with symptoms of neuropathy, Houston. Just real, and just because I actually have no feeling in my knee down. So um, due to obvious impingement of nerves and all the back surgeries I've had and, all the other damage that's been done, right? So I'm just trying right. to uh, find a different solution, which I used to utilize acupuncture and massage therapy um, and utilization of other modalities that helped me get back on my feet. Uh, I just had a slip up here probably about six months ago. So, you know, something that's very important to remember, Houston, uh, is that. Um, acupuncture is is just a part of traditional Chinese medicine that's been around for 4,000 years. So, you know, there's herbs, there's ancient oils, there's so many remedies now that are, um, you know, coming now to the to market and, and a lot of companies are spotlighting um, because they, in fact, do help. You know, we look at a full body approach when it comes to holistic medicine. So, you know, is weight an issue, right? You know, um, like how long has the trauma been around? Is, is, it, is it relieved more by heat or by cold? You know, do weather conditions affect the body? So there's so many ways and angles that we can, we can look at it, not just, hey, specific to just the source, right? Sometimes when the light bulb doesn't work, you have to go to the switch, not just change the light bulb. Perfect. That's that makes a complete sense. I have another question from one of our one of our people, of our guests. Um, Dr. Emmy mentioned something about other options for SSRIs. What are the natural options? Um, well, I mean, I have to qualify this by saying if someone comes to me on SSRIs, I don't wholesale just take them off of them. I work on getting their body to a state where they can make their own neurotransmitters before I would do anything like that. Uh, but uh, some of the natural alternatives to SSRIs are um, a combination of NAC and taurine, which actually help with anxiety. So NAC is a, is a supplement that actually helps degrade a um, neurotransmitter in the brain that causes a lot of anxiety called glutamate. And then taurine, on the other hand, helps to bring about a neurotransmitter called GABA that really helps with calming nerves and anxiety. And it's actually one of the things I use in neuropathy also. Um, so that's one thing if, if the SSRI is being used for anxiety, that's one route that I can go. Uh, L-theanine, which is a precursor to serotonin is something that I use really commonly. And the nice thing about L-theanine is it leaves the gut as just the amino acid L-theanine and it gets changed into serotonin in the brain. Um, 5-HTP is similar, it's also a, a, a um, sort of uh, precursor to serotonin. The good thing about that is then you don't have a big serotonin kind of bomb going on and off in the gut that will then make the gut leaky. Um, saffron is another super amazing um, ancient remedy for uh, depression and anxiety that really helps serotonin levels. But again, um, the compounds in saffron help more in the brain. They don't compromise the gut uh, integrity. And uh, there are actually head-to-head -head studies of saffron with things like Prozac showing that it works just as well. Again, if you're on Prozac, don't just wholesale go off it and go on saffron without the help of a doctor that's monitoring everything. But um, those alternatives are there um, along with getting things right. For instance, if you have the MTHFR mutation and you're not taking the right kind of B vitamins and, or you're taking B vitamins that are clogging your pathways, your chances of recovering from depression are much, much lower than if we get that right. So looking at you as a whole person and correcting what we can um, and then using more natural alternatives is kind of my approach to treating depression and anxiety. 
acupuncture and acupuncture techniques, mind body wellness techniques actually really, really help with that too. So wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have one more question. Um, I, the question is, um, will it be advisable for a type one diabetes patient to use acupuncture? You erased it on There's no contraindication that I know of, do you, Dr. Nice? No. To use acupuncture to help to help them not lose feeling in their extremities and prevent nerve damage. Yeah, there, there, there are no contraindications to that. No contradictions, okay. Yeah. And 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 I do want to say something if if that's okay, unless we had another question. Oh, please. The Go beauty ahead. about this medicine right now, because it's not just in my community here in Central Florida. It's it's in every community right now. You know the stats are are are, are very grim. You know as 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 um, a young entrepreneur and professional, my 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 friends, my colleagues are dying. You know if you're under the age of forty, right now in in, in my community, and you die, the number one cause of death is overdose. Okay. This is very, very serious. And what I appreciate about alternatives to opioids is, is that it's really turning the focus to the human. I had a patient that, that came in and she just looked very, very frantic and frazzled and I knew something was going on. And she said that, you know what? My boo is, is on the streets with a bat and I don't want him to know that I'm coming here. I'm afraid. And the beauty about Altos, Alternatives to Opioids, it's a nonverbal approach to, to, to this crisis where she could just come in, get her treatments, and, and really leave the office without anything, without her, her boyfriend knowing that she was doing something. And, and, and after actually a while, she gained the courage. And, and of course, this does not re replace the verbal uh, the beauty about the, the verbal communication when it comes to, you know, mental health treatments and counseling, et cetera. However, this lady was just too afraid to, to talk with, with, with her loved one about this just because of his level of abuse. And he, you know, he was obviously um, not, not in the right mind due to substance abuse. And actually after three, it was about three to five treatments, uh, she, she gained the courage, this willpower where she could um, communicate with him um, and, and really get him on her page um, in, in a very peaceful way where he could be nonviolent and aggressive. And she even encouraged him to come in our practice. And, and after I, I, about three months of, of care, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very proud to say that, that they are now uh, drug-free. So again, it's, it's just a, a beautiful approach, a beautiful nonverbal approach to, to a lot of the verbal abuse that, that is going out on the streets right now in our communities. Started, I would like to thank the people that made this webinar possible. Central Florida Cares um, Health Systems, Lutheran Services of Florida Health Systems, and Southeast Florida Behavior Health Network. We also have upcoming webinars. Please go to our website to look at these. Thank you all for joining us to, the, to our webinar series, Solutions to the Opioid Crisis. 